With Deus Ex Invisible War, Ironstorm had the unenviable task of following up one of the greatest PC games ever made. The original Deus Ex was critically and commercially acclaimed and succeeded at nearly everything it set out to do, except perhaps the gunplay. Deus Ex had a conspiracy packed 40 hour campaign set in a cyberpunk world corrupted by large corporations, with secret groups behind the scenes like the Illuminati, plus aliens, Area 51, artificial intelligence and global pandemics thrown in for good measure. The game rewarded multiple playthroughs thanks to large maps with plenty of routes to the objective, many of them inaccessible depending on your build. The deep skill and augmentation system let you play as everything from a melee focused stealth character who lockpicked every door in their way, to rocket wielding action superheroes who blew doors off their hinges to get through, to uh, really good swimmers who swam under doors I guess. How on earth was Iron Storm to improve on greatness? With Invisible War the answer to that question was to not try. Don't try to make another 40 hour campaign that challenged players to look at the increasingly powerful role corporations have in society. Instead develop a 12 hour campaign that barely has any theme or message beyond presenting a slightly dystopian future society. Don't try to create a new cyberpunk story that builds on an already well established fictional world and imagine how it's changed since the first game. Instead rehash the same groups and characters from the previous story and treat the entire thing more like a glorified epilogue. Don't improve on or even replicate the large maps that rewarded player exploration and character builds. Instead chop them up into tiny sections that prohibit any exploration and ignore character build variety. And certainly don't think of cool new skills to let players create specialised characters. Instead remove skills entirely and do away with the concept of specialisation, letting and even encouraging players to do and see everything in that one 12 hour playthrough. To be fair Ironstorm did improve on the shooting, so that's something. I will say up front that I don't think Invisible War is terrible, it's not an affront to gaming. I think it's somewhere between quite bad and okay I guess. It's fine but boring. If you've played Devil May Cry 2 then you probably know the feeling, although it's slightly better than that travesty. The internet is a land of extreme opinions, so I should point out that Invisible War isn't as terrible as some people make it out to be. That said it's also not as good as others like to claim. Invisible War is one of those weird games that needs to be grouped alongside Fallout 4, Mass Effect Andromeda, Splinter Cell Conviction and Resident Evil 6. Games that people love to defend by saying it's a good game, it's just not a good insert name of franchise here game. I need to come up with a catchy title for games like those because it's fast becoming a genre in its own right. If you ever hear anyone say this know that there's a 99% chance the game they're talking about is mediocre at best. If it wasn't they wouldn't use that language, they would say something like Halo Wars is really good it's just an RTS not an FPS so beware of that going in. You wouldn't or shouldn't say Halo Wars is really good it's just not a good Halo game, that doesn't mean anything. I did my best to see the positives in Invisible War and put to one side the fact that it's a sequel to Deus Ex. I can see why people don't hate it. Invisible War is bland and uninteresting but it's also easy. It doesn't challenge the player either intellectually or in terms of game design. And let's face it, we all enjoy games like that once in a while, or maybe quite often. If we didn't, Ubisoft would have disappeared from the industry long ago. Much like modern open world games, you can coast through Invisible War without having to think, and you are practically superhuman in what you can do. The enemies don't stand a chance. Invisible War has a lot in common with Splinter Cell Conviction in that regard. If you were to play both games without any expectations, and preferably without having paid anywhere near full price for them, you could have an okay time. You'd be on autopilot for the most part, but neither game lasts long enough to become painfully tedious, just mildly numbing. As for why the sequel to such a tense, challenging and interesting game ended up being the sort of thing you play while catching up on podcasts, well there's a temptation to lay the blame at the feet of the humble Xbox. While Deus Ex was developed as a PC only title, with a port subsequently made for the Playstation 2, Invisible War was developed primarily for Xbox and ported to PC. It was a console game first and foremost. As we'll see this meant maps had to be much smaller due to limited RAM on the Xbox, and the RPG aspects were cut drastically, being seen as overly complicated for a console game. I dislike the narrative of blaming a console, and by implication the console audience, for the dumbing down of a great PC game, however there is undeniably some truth to it. The level design clearly suffered and the decision to strip down the skill system was motivated by the desire to appeal to a more casual audience, even though that wasn't actually necessary. 
as Knights of the Old Republic showed, you could make RPGs for consoles in the early 2000s without stripping out everything that makes them RPGs. However, it's also hard to blame Ironstorm for focusing on making a console game. For as highly regarded as Deus Ex undoubtedly is, and for as poorly regarded as Invisible War is, Invisible War sold slightly better than Deus Ex, with Invisible War racking up 1.2 million copies, compared to Deus Ex's 1 million. Not bad for a clearly inferior product. And it was inferior. Look, when even Harvey Smith, the lead director of the game, is out there ragging on it, then you know there are problems. In an interview with Warren Spector, Smith acknowledged the poor quality of the technology, the AI, and the story. We fucked up the technology management of it. We screwed up the... We had bad team chemistry. We wrote the wrong renderer. We wrote the wrong kind of AI. Uh, and then we shipped too early. And, and, you know, the story was even bad. Like Smith said he listened to the wrong people when trying to improve on the original. He listened to the people who didn't like the first game instead of those that did. The result was a sequel that barely resembles the original, and not in a good way. I'm not even sure what type of game Invisible War was trying to be. The removal of skills and limited dialogue options means you'd be hard pushed to call it an RPG, even defining the genre as broadly as the modern audience appears to. It hardly stands out as an immersive sim because there aren't enough options for players to take to achieve their goals. While you can easily remain undetected, I wouldn't put the stealth label on it because you're so powerful you don't need to worry about getting caught. It's not much of a shooter because there aren't many enemies. One of the pre-release marketing terms that the team threw around was hybrid action FPS, which is about as good a description as I can think of even though, or perhaps because, it doesn't mean anything. Invisible War is so limited that simply describing what you do in the game would be both short and boring, so instead I'm going to talk about what you can't do in the game with reference to the first Deus Ex. That will be long and boring, which is much more my style. And yes, I will compare Invisible War to Deus Ex a lot, despite saying I would judge Invisible War on its own merits. The comparison perfectly illustrates how devoid Invisible War is of anything that could be described as compelling. If Invisible War had replaced the things it removed from Deus Ex, it would be easier to judge the game separately. However, all it did was strip things out. The first and most problematic change was the removal of player skills. Deus Ex gave you a list of skills to choose from, a mixture of weapon and environmental abilities. This let players build a character who was good at some things and bad at others, a fairly core aspect of an RPG. For weapons, you could specialise in melee, pistols, rifles, explosives, and demolition your choice drastically affected how you played the game. Specialising in melee weapons led you towards a stealthy approach because you'd probably sneak up on enemies not run at them while they shoot you. If you're good with pistols, you'd likely avoid taking on large mechs. However, if you were handy with grenades, you might take them out. Explosives were handy for blowing open doors, but those same doors could be opened with a lockpick or a multi-tool. Or you might find the key code by hacking a computer. And lest we forget, you could focus on getting better at swimming. By removing skills, Invisible War made you a master of all trades right from the start. With no weapon skills, you don't have to think about what type of weapon you're going to specialise in because you can use all of them whenever you like. At the start of Deus Ex, your aim was all over the place until you invested in points in that type of weapon. In Invisible War, you can pick out headshots with a pistol from across the room without aiming down sights before you've even left the training area. For the most part, Invisible War doesn't have character builds. Everyone is largely the same. The only hint of flexibility comes in the augmentation system. In pre-release interviews, the devs described the augmentation system as an amalgamation of skills and orgs from the previous game, but that's pushing it a bit. It's basically the previous augmentation system stripped down, with the hacking ability moved from the skill list to the augmentation list. You can augment five body slots. Each slot has a choice of three possible augmentations, two regular ones and a special black market augmentation. In theory, you're forced to miss out on two abilities per slot, however most of the decisions are no-brainers. E.g. there are many more opportunities to use a cloak that makes you invisible to organic enemies than there is a hazard drone that protects from radiation, and a cloak that makes you invisible to bots and electronic devices comes in far more handy than a defence drone that blows up the odd grenade or rocket. The decision to merge skills and augmentations seems to be a case of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Smith talked about how a complaint for the original Deus Ex was that there were essentially two overlapping swimming abilities. There was a swimming skill and a separate swimming augmentation. I agree that was a mistake, however the mistake was having a swimming augmentation when it was already a skill, or vice versa. 
Deciding to do away with skills entirely just to avoid the possibility of duplication was overkill. Just don't duplicate stuff. Also, despite the effort to trim down abilities through the augmentation system, there is still overlap, with two of the 15 possible choices being specifically for health regeneration. You also get way too many biomod canisters, both regular and black market. Not only can you easily max out all five of your chosen augmentations by the halfway point, unless you choose five black market orgs, I guess, you can also change your mind and choose new augmentations and max them out as well. Sure, technically the system offers limits. There are 15 choices and you can only have five active at any one time. That sounds limiting. However, you can easily try out all the ones you're interested in in one playthrough. And trust me, you can ignore the health options entirely for reasons I'll get to later. The choices are even designed to be easy to make. The first ASX let you use orgs to be invisible to organic or electronic enemies, but not both, because those augmentations took up the same slot. Invisible War places the cloak augmentations in different slots, letting you be invisible to everything. There's also no separate lockpicking or electronic skill this time around. You can't play as a skilled lockpick in Invisible War, or rather you have to. Anyone can pick locks or keypads with exactly the same amount of skill right from the start and will always need the same number of tools to do so. And there are so many multi-tools lying around that you can pick each and every lock you find. In Deus Ex, I maxed out my skills in both lock picking and electronics, which covered both physical and electrical locks, and I still couldn't open everything I found for fear of being short of tools later on. Not to mention in Deus Ex you needed two types of tools, lock picks and multi-tools. In Invisible War you only need multi-tools, and they are these weird magic wand things. You feel more like Harry Potter than an augmented human when using these things to pick physical locks. Actually, I think at one point during development there were two different types of lock picking tools. You see, there's a cap on how many multi-tools you can stack in one inventory slot of 20, except a couple of times multi-tools would not stack even when there was space. They needed an inventory slot of their own, which was quite annoying because inventory space is limited. I believe there were originally two types of lock picking tools, multi-tools and lock picks. At some point during development, to keep simplifying things, the lockpicks were all changed to multi-tools, but some of them were left coded as lockpicks. Therefore, even though they look identical, they take up separate inventory slots because the game thinks they're different assets. Or maybe it's just a bug, but that's not as interesting. Another change is that you no longer need to manually enter key codes to open doors. If you've been given the key code, say via a data cube or an NPC, then Alex opens the door automatically. If you don't have the information, he won't. That's it. Quite often the game doesn't even bother to tell you the specific code. It just says generic stuff like the code is attached. I know this sounds minor, but I like being able to enter the key codes myself. I find it gives an enhanced feeling of accomplishment around finding the code in the first place. Plus, being able to enter key codes manually means they can be used as part of puzzles, like the one in Paul Denton's apartment. Speaking of things the game does for you, there's no hacking minigame or way to enter passwords to hack computers. You just need the augmentation and it's all done for you. It takes a second or two and even though you can be spotted, that's rare and there's usually no punishment even if they do spot you. These small emissions really do make a difference to the experience. To hack an ATM, you just click on the ATM. You don't need any passwords nor do you even need to withdraw the money. It's all done for you. Just click on the ATM, wait a second or two, collect 600 credits. It's always 600 credits for some reason. For context, most side quests reward about two or 300 credits, so this is a lot of money for no effort. When you've hacked a computer terminal, you're presented with a boring list that doesn't even look like it's part of a computer screen. From here, you just turn cameras and turrets on and off. You can't snoop and read people's emails or get secret information that helps you in the level. There's no view of all the cameras that represents what a security guard might look at. It's all just so bland. It's also far too easy to turn off turrets or even switch them over to work for you or take control of them directly. This used to require a big skill investment in Deus Ex. Here it's just a no-brainer way to use your black market biomods of which you'll have plenty. The oversupply of these augmentation canisters starts right in the opening mission when you're given three before you even know what's going on. Remember, there are only five slots, so having three canisters lets you access your preferred 60% of the regular abilities before you've left the training area. You can upgrade each skill to level 3, however most upgrades simply reduce the drain on your biochem resources when using the ability. They don't necessarily make the ability more useful, and you'll never be short of biochem energy anyway. Here are the augmentations I opened up right at the start. 
near complete invisibility to human enemies, near complete invisibility to electrical devices like bots and cameras, and reduced noise when crawling. That means from the first 10 minutes of the game I had almost a full stealth build. All I really needed was to upgrade the noise augmentation to make less noise when walking and then running, but still I had a build that let me walk right past all human enemies and all electrical enemies and monitoring devices. Complete freedom basically. Obviously this made stealth rather easy, but combat was no more challenging. As discussed you don't need to build up any particular weapon skills, you're immediately awesome with every weapon. Most weapons can be upgraded with a standard set of mods like increased damage, silencers, and strangely the ability to break glass without setting off alarms for that one time when you desperately want to break the glass in an empty street to get needless resources and also want to be quiet when doing it. Another simplification for weapons was the decision to use one type of ammo for all weapons. Oh, and you don't even need to reload them despite the ammo being presented as having clip sizes. I can understand this in games like Mass Effect when projectiles are energy based. It makes less sense when you are actually firing bullets, rockets or even fire via the flamethrower. Generally the bigger guns use more of the ammo, so I personally stuck to a pistol and sniper rifle most of the time. I suppose the ammo system fits well with the general attitude towards weapons in that you're supposed to be able to whip out any weapon you like at any time because there's no need to specialise. Clearly Iron Storm didn't want to limit the player's ability to use weapons in any way. So having just one type of ammo ensured you were never in a situation where you needed rockets but didn't have any on hand. With that in mind perhaps the universal ammo concept was more a symptom of a bigger problem than a problem in and of itself. On a more minor note I got the impression Iron Storm wasn't quite sure whether it wanted players to have access to maps of areas and buildings. The first game usually made you find maps within the levels. Invisible War technically makes you do the same thing, but in the spirit of simplifying everything that can possibly be simplified, it always gives them to you right at the start of each new area. They're almost impossible to miss and might as well have been given to you automatically. It's hardly a stretch to think that you might have access to maps before you visit new areas in the year 2072. The net result of all these tweaks to the successful formula of the first game is that you can do anything and there's no challenge. In the first game the large bots were generally quite threatening and my approach was to avoid them where possible. That usually meant sneaking past them or perhaps turning them off via a computer if I could find one. The latter wasn't especially easy because the levels were large with lots of computers. Finding the one you needed to turn off the bots meant exploring, which required you to put yourself at risk in other ways. In Invisible War the bots present no threat because there are so many ways to handle them. First, the levels are smaller, so if there is a computer that switches off the bot, you'll easily be able to find it. Second, and for the same reason, the secret paths are obvious. You don't have to go out of your way to find hidden vents because there's no room to go out of your way to, and therefore the vent will be unmissable. Third, you'll probably have an augmentation that makes you invisible to robots, so you could just activate that and walk past. Fourth, EMP grenades are plentiful, and because you don't need any special grenade throwing ability, you will definitely be able to use them efficiently. Fifth, you can use some of the big ass weapons like the mag rail or the rocket launcher to take them out, and again you don't need any skill to do this. Sixth, one of the biomods lets you take over and control bots. If you have that biomod, all you have to do is get close enough to touch the bot briefly. You can then run away while you establish a link. There's no need to worry about breaking line of sight or staying in range. Controlling the bots lets you eliminate all other threats in the area, and once you're done the bot automatically deactivates. Oh and if you're worried about the risks associated with walking up to a large bot, don't worry because the ability to go invisible to bots is in a different augmentation category to the ability to control them so you can double up. And finally reason number 7 is that there's a separate category of augmentation that lets you control EMP drones that you can detonate right next to bots to kill them easily. These aren't on a cooldown timer so you can keep spamming them as much as you like as long as you have enough energy and you will because bio sales are all over the place. As I've mentioned a few times now, Invisible War is incredibly easy, painfully so. There are four difficulties and I picked Realistic because I knew from prior experience that Invisible War was much easier than the original. Realistic is presented as the hardest difficulty setting. While it's not explained in game, realistic difficulty makes enemies go down with fewer shots but also makes Alex incredibly vulnerable. I love difficulty settings like this. The standard you take more damage and enemies take less thing is a boring way of upping difficulty and watching human enemies act like bullet sponges is off putting. Unfortunately Invisible War doesn't go anywhere near far enough. Enemies do go down quickly although I wouldn't say it's realistic as such. 
They take two headshots, for example. However, Alex can take a lot of damage. Yes, he can technically die at any point from a stray headshot, and I did die in one hit once when a rocket hit me at close range, but that was it. You can be ripped to shreds by a turret and only lose about one third health. You take way more damage than enemies, and I had to check a couple of times to make sure I hadn't set the difficulty to normal by mistake. The only thing that does notable damage is radiation, and that's rarely a factor. There are also a lot of health packs lying around. The cap per stack is 10, which I nearly always filled up, and I reached the cap of 50 for items like soda cans and soy bars, which provide almost as much health recovery as the dedicated health packs. On this supposed realistic difficulty, I could have easily whipped out an SMG and walked around shooting everything without too much trouble. You can even pause the game to use health recovery items. Some mini boss fights provide a bit of a challenge if you happen to get caught without a gun in hand, but even then you can just throw out a concussion grenade or something and win easily. Enemy AI is terrible. They're good at detecting noise, but don't know how to react to it. NPCs go into alert mode if, for example, they hear you in events, but if they happen to be on your side at the time, they stay in alert mode forever because they don't register that it was a friendly who made the noise. They also often forget to trigger alarms when they've spotted you. All in all, there was nothing I ever felt threatened by. The first Deus Ex game had the infamous men or women in black. They were quite tough, although I found a reliable way to defeat them, namely by throwing gas grenades and emptying a clip while they choked. They were still intimidating though. I had to make a conscious effort to keep gas grenades on hand, and while I was busy shooting them, other enemies were shooting at me, so it's still not exactly a guaranteed win. Oh, and my aim with gas grenades wasn't great because I hadn't specialised in explosives. Conversely, in Invisible War, you can kill JC Denton and his brother Paul with one shot to the head, same as everyone else. I did try experimenting with hard mode instead of realistic to see if it was one of those odd situations where the realistic mode is actually easier, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Enemies do take more hits to kill on hard, but so do you. You get more ammo per clip, so that compensates for using more to kill enemies. I think realistic is the hardest setting, but if it's not, the difference is minimal and the game is way too easy overall. The annoying thing about all these simplifications is that most of them didn't need to be made. I can understand cutting down on the number of augmentations due to controller interface limitations, but console gamers could have handled a skill system alongside the augmentations, as shown with games like Knights of the Old Republic and Morrowind. On the other hand, the Xbox was undeniably responsible for one major shortfall in Invisible War, and that's the level design. Invisible War had a couple of decent sized maps when looked at as a whole, however the maps are broken down into painfully small chunks. On release this meant a lot of time spent on loading screens and the load times were horrendous. That's not a huge problem when playing on PC in 2020, although stay tuned for a fairly major loading screen related problem later on. The real problem with the maps being split into small chunks was not more time being spent on loading screens, it was the way tiny maps had to limit player choice in how to navigate. The large maps Invisible War does have generally consist of a hub area with buildings or smaller open areas that you must go through loading screens to access. Take Cairo for example. You start in South Medina. From here you can go into buildings like Arcology or the Greenhouse, however entering any of those buildings brings up a loading screen. Likewise, if you want to go to the mosque, you first need to head into North Medina, which requires a load screen, and then enter the mosque itself, which is another load screen. These zones are all independent mini levels. With the exception of the mosque, which has a second entrance in the Arcology building, you can't do anything fancy when it comes to breaking into these places. You must go through the front door. You have options once you're inside, however your options are always confined to the very small spaces that make up the building you're in or part of the building you're in, in the case of the Arcology building. Once inside that main building, you hit loading zones when traveling to Tarsus Academy, a corporate office, and an air terminal. This is incredibly limiting when it comes to providing choice for how players navigate levels, which to me is a key part of an immersive sim. In my Deus Ex video, I highlighted how you could sneak into the Statue of Liberty instead of going through the front door, and how this required a huge detour. You had to really explore to find the less risky route inside. Invisible War wasn't built to allow this. Buildings are truly separate and therefore you can't go on lengthy detours because there's no space to do so. You're never tasked with anything dramatic like breaking into the Statue of Liberty because you're always expected to go through the front door first. I do wonder whether breaking the locations up in such a strict fashion was necessary. 
Deus Ex did use loading screens between areas, and if there was more than one route to that area, it would simply have loading screens in different places. If you entered a new building through the front door, there was a loading screen, and if you entered via the roof, there was another one, just in a different place. You still had multiple points of entry. Whatever the exact cause though, the levels are tiny and offer very little in the way of optional routes. You don't have to think much about where to go or how because you're in such a small space. You can see what the entire level has to offer just by looking around. One quick scan and you've seen all the vents, and those vents rarely take you to interesting places because they can only lead to places within the small section that's been loaded in. The lack of vertical space was another notable omission. In the first game I spent quite a bit of time climbing up buildings and traversing rooftops, but I didn't do that once in Invisible War. There was one section where I could get on top of some pipes to sneak past an animal and that was it. The Knights Templar compound had me excited for a bit when I was told I could sneak in via the sewers, but that turned out just to be one tiny path underground with a couple of ladders. Hardly a game changing experience that demands multiple playthroughs. With the maps divided into tiny segments, you might expect each of these small areas to be dense with activity, but they're all rather sterile. Visually the environments look good, they just aren't populated. Seattle is divided into a wealthy upper region and lower slums, and the environments look the part. Wealthy areas are corporate and boring, while the slums are obviously rough and dirty by comparison. However, part of conveying wealth and poverty is the people who inhabit those areas, and well, hardly anyone inhabits these areas. The corporate parts like Upper Seattle look like an office if you were to accidentally show up three hours before work starts. The Arcology building in Cairo is absolutely deserted. The Knights Templar have set up one of those recruitment booths like you might get in a mall where Comcast tries to lock you into an expensive contract while you wonder what you're doing in a mall anyway. Except there's no foot traffic here at all. It's like you've been locked in the mall after hours. Likewise with the place that looks like an airport except it's basically deserted, which come to think of it is probably quite an accurate depiction of airports right now. The slum areas are slightly better with a few people hanging around generally looking miserable, but it doesn't come close to the abject poverty you saw in the first ASX. Speaking of the slums, for some reason these identical maintenance doors are used everywhere, including in cities, and they rarely lead to any kind of maintenance area. I don't take issue with assets being copied and pasted, but surely the devs could have removed the maintenance sign if the door doesn't actually lead to a maintenance area. Invisible War has about the bare minimum number and variety of locations. In addition to Seattle and Cairo, the latter of which you visit twice, you have Trier in Germany and Antarctica, plus you end the game on Liberty Island where the first game began, which makes for some nice book ending. The levels don't have enough local flavour, especially when you're indoors. With Antarctica as an obvious exception, the other locations are often interchangeable. Sure there are slight differences in building exteriors for Seattle, Trier and Cairo, but once you're inside a building, which you nearly always are, you can't tell which city you're in due to a lack of local languages and scenery. Unless you happen to spot the Space Needle in the skyline, you really could be anywhere. In the first game you could tell the levels apart in a second. Hong Kong could only have been Hong Kong with all those neon lights and markets. New York even had districts that looked distinct from each other, and none of them looked anything like Paris. The lack of variety and reliance on indoor environments makes the story feel far less global than that of the first game. Sure, we technically went to Europe and Africa, but you'd be hard pushed to remember any environment beyond Antarctica. I'm going to give a quick story summary. If you want to skip the descriptive stuff, then jump to the time on screen now. Invisible War's story takes place 20 years after Deus Ex, and it kind of treats all three Deus Ex endings as partially canon. According to Invisible War, JC Denton merged with the Helios AI, destroyed Area 51, which wiped out decades of technological progress and kickstarted what is known as the Collapse, and also incidentally helped the Illuminati stay in power because they used the Collapse to their advantage. The game starts with a terrorist attack that wipes out the entire city of Chicago via a nanite explosion. Protagonist Alex D barely escapes Chicago along with a few colleagues from Tarsus, the training camp he was a part of. Alex is transferred to the Seattle branch of Tarsus, but barely has time to throw a basketball around his room when that building is also attacked, this time by a group called The Order who claim Alex D is a test subject being secretly monitored. Sure enough, during the escape there's a cool moment when a fake ceiling stops working and Alex can see his observers. We later find out that Tarsus Academy is run by Apostle Corps, which was started by Paul Denton, JC's brother, who is alive in this game. 
Apostle Core uses people like Alex to test augmentations and plans to spread them to the entire human race so that humanity can be run by the merged JC Denton and Helios AI. Something similar was supposed to happen at the end of Deus Ex if JC chose to merge with Helios, however the augmentations in JC's mind clashed with the AI, stopping them from implementing their plan. To no one's surprise, Alex turns out to be an experimental clone of JC and Paul Denton. We saw his clone tank in the first game. He was taken from Area 51 as a child and then raised in the Tarsus Academy. The whole Alex being a clone reveal was quite amusing for how unsubtle it is. The game always refers to him specifically as Alex D. Everyone else has a surname, but Alex just has this ominous initial. Even in the pre-release marketing, the developers went to great lengths to call him Alex D, as if it was completely normal to refer to your main protagonist by their first name and then an initial for their surname. Like, did they really think people wouldn't add two and two together here? Well done, Alex D. Anyway, after escaping Chicago, Alex D heads to Seattle, Cairo and Germany, chasing down leads on JC Denton on behalf of three factions, although the exact nature of these factions shifts as you play. The World Trade Organization, or WTO, currently controls the city-states and is very much the law and order group, believing that the current capitalist system is working just fine, thank you very much. A religious faction known as the Order pops up to challenge the WTO by fighting it at every turn. The Knights Templar is a radical splinter group from the Order who hate augmented beings. The Knights Templar is the group that attacked Chicago at the beginning of the story. They wiped out the entire city just to try and kill Alex D and his colleagues. There's a good twist around the halfway point when you discover that despite holding opposing viewpoints, the WTO and the Order are both run by the Illuminati, who are still alive and kicking under the leadership of Nicolette Duclair, who was in the first game. The Illuminati, unsurprisingly, still want to rule the world and create a global surveillance state. There's also a fourth quasi-faction hanging around called the Omar. These guys are so heavily modified they make Simon Cowell's face look natural. You can complete missions for them during the game to get discounts on black market goods. You find JC in Antarctica where he reveals his big plan to spread biomods throughout the world, however he needs the Aquinas Protocol from Liberty Island. Every group needs this protocol in one way or another, either to destroy it or use it. Once you have the Aquinas Protocol you decide who to give it to, which effectively dictates your ending. There are four endings, none of which depend in any way on your actions up until you get the protocol. You can choose whichever ending you like just by replaying the last five minutes. I saw all the endings within about half an hour. If you decide to work with JC Denton, then biomods are spread across the world and Helios encourages humanity to begin anew. The Illuminati creates a global surveillance state, much as they would have done at the end of the first game. The Knights Templar turns the world into a global theocracy under which biomods are banned and those with them are hunted down. Finally, you can kill the leaders of all three groups and side with the Omar. I'm not entirely sure what the Omar truly believe in, but whatever it is, things don't end well. The cutscene you get for this ending looks like the introductory scene of a Fallout game. It's not much of a story. As I mentioned earlier, the entire thing feels more like an expanded epilogue or a piece of fan fiction to the story of Deus Ex and it does a separate story in its own right. I mean, you even have two of the four endings recycled directly from the first game. Oh, and I should point out there is a fifth ending of sorts. On the last level, if you take a flag into the bathroom and flush the toilet, you get transported to a nightclub with a bunch of weird developer conversations. The story presents some interesting ideas, but doesn't develop them or present them in a way that encourages you to think about them. The initial faction struggle between the WTO and the Order about how best to run cities becomes essentially irrelevant once we discover that both groups are controlled by the Illuminati. We never got to know the WTO or the Order beyond a basic sketch of their beliefs, perhaps on purpose given that the Illuminati involvement meant these groups didn't have fundamental values. Regardless, there are no conversations that come close to the one you had with the terrorist at the top of the Statue of Liberty. That was a complicated issue. I learned something and it helped inform my decisions going forward. In Invisible War, I ended up supporting the WTO more often than the Order, simply because the Order kept asking me to kill people. They had a similar problem to the Scoia Tale in The Witcher 2. They might have admirable goals, but they go about them in the worst possible way. The Order was borderline comical at times. In one mission, when I refused to do what they asked, they casually sent a couple of assassins to kill me. When those assassins inevitably failed, the Order was just casually like, see, that's what happens when you mess with us, and then carried on asking us to do things for them. Most of the factions have a similar issue. 
Any given faction is both a potential future ally and an immediate enemy, so you can in theory be following the instructions of the Knights Templar while also being shot at by their soldiers. Speaking of the Knights Templar, they were a comically one-sided organisation. There's no nuance to them and no reason to side with them short of a desire to see all the endings. For a start they hate all augmented humans and Alex is very augmented. I saved a Knights Templar from a prison cell but he still tried to kill me when he realised I was augmented. Both Deus Ex and Invisible War start with terrorist attacks. Deus Ex started with an attack on the Statue of Liberty and UNATCO and it turned out that the terrorists were simply trying to ensure the Ambrosia vaccine was properly distributed to people. UNATCO ended up being the bad guys. Invisible War started with the Knights Templar killing everyone in Chicago and sure enough they were the bad guys. Not exactly nuanced. Invisible War's main story is really about JC Denton and Helios, who are inseparable at this point, and whether they should be given power over the entire world. Except we don't find any of this out until near the end of the Antarctica level. All that's left after JC's big info dump is to go back to Cairo to save Paul Denton and then meet them in the Statue of Liberty. It's all very well and good presenting this big faction war that forces you to choose sides all the time, but it doesn't really work if those factions aren't relevant by the end game and have been replaced by new groups and ideas. And Alex is a terrible protagonist, especially when it comes to challenging JC's big plan. It never feels like Alex is having a conversation with JC. Alex, and therefore the player, are just passive listeners. In the first game, JC had that tense conversation with an AI in Everett's house, where he asked questions and challenged the AI's belief system. Alex's attempts to challenge JC are more like deliberate softball questions to provide JC an excuse to preach his ideas further. I'm going to establish the first post-human civilization, and you're my first citizen. Welcome. A new civilization? That's a pretty tall order. What do you need from me? JC's plan isn't horrible, not when compared to others at least. The idea of instant democracy where everyone is equal in body and mind and decisions can be made instantly by polling the population through their biomods isn't without some appeal. However, you also can't question the minor detail of forcing biomods into every human on the planet, when clearly a lot of people object to the practice. I'm sure some religious groups would take issue with it for a start. And the idea that everyone would be equal in body and mind is again appealing, but we know that under capitalist systems it's not a simple case of the brightest, hardest working people being the most successful. There's a hell of a lot of luck involved. There's no suggestion of a switch to communism here, so wouldn't the capitalist system just ensure that history repeats itself? Money would still end up gathering in the hands of the few, not the many. Mind you, perhaps with such easy voting systems in place, the many would vote to distribute the wealth. However, history once again shows us that people vote against their own self-interest on these matters. Being able to vote instantly doesn't solve the problem of informing the people of the consequences of their votes. Any half-decent protagonist would challenge such extreme ideas. Alex D doesn't care. He doesn't have any ideas of his own. He's a puppet, except it's not the player pulling the strings, it's the game. You don't even get to be the puppet master, you're just watching the show. Alex isn't bothered about little details like how he was grown in a vat specifically to be a guinea pig or that it was Paul Denton's company running all those tests on him. This might be another one of those situations where the character is supposed to be a blank slate to make it easier for role playing as the character, but players get very few opportunities to role play here so it doesn't really make much sense. The game technically gives you an option to kill all the leaders at the end to side with the Omar, but you never feel like Alex is rebelling against his past or doing it to make a statement. It's more a favour for another group of people. He never does anything for himself. As another example, Alex is so utterly devoid of any personality that he doesn't even react when he meets and talks to aliens. Alex is also quite stupid. He's surprised that the man in charge of secretly monitoring him knows his name, as if such incredible attention to detail would be beyond this top secret scientific organisation. One positive about Invisible War's story is that it doesn't feel quite so out of place in 2020 when compared to the first game. I mentioned in my review of Deus Ex that it felt uncomfortable to watch conspiracy theories play out as fact in a world where the President of the United States is out there supporting QAnon and other dangerous nonsense. If you haven't watched that video, the gist of it was that I don't find conspiracy theories to be harmless fun anymore. I still love the original game, I just found parts of it a bit awkward 20 years after release. I'm pleased to say that my opinion was universally well received and definitely didn't trigger a bunch of angry internet babies. I have no enemies, merely topographies of ignorance. 
Much to my disappointment, because I love triggering angry internet babies, Invisible War was too tame to give rise to any hot topics for this video. There is one awkward moment where Alex scolds the Order for destroying machines that are polluting the local area and gives them the whole vandalism is still a crime speech. That definitely got my attention given how some people in the real world are more concerned with a few broken windows than the lives of black people. Mainly though Invisible War has nothing that strikes a chord in 2020, for better or worse, because it has so little to say. Deus Ex was opinionated. It was my first exposure to the idea that corporations hold too much power, and even though there was no good ending choice, I made a decision I was morally happy with. What is Invisible War about? The title references the invisible war going on behind the scenes with JC and the Illuminati. But even though those groups oppose each other and are somewhat hidden, we spend so little time thinking or challenging their ideas that all they are is names. The JC revelation came too late and the Illuminati never gave you any good reasons to side with them. They never laid out their vision for the world in a way that sounded even remotely appealing. It's almost like they know they are the bad guys, when everyone knows that the best bad guys think they are the good guys. If you hadn't played the first game, you'd know very little about what the Illuminati stands for based on just Invisible War. I guess the Invisible War was so invisible we couldn't even see it, but that doesn't make for particularly compelling stories. Perhaps there's also an Invisible War going on inside Alex as he struggles with what to do, but as stated, we don't see that play out. Invisible War tries to get you to relate to each of the factions through Alex's colleagues, like Billy Adams, who encourages you to join the Knights Templar. This did nothing for me because I didn't know anything about Billy beyond a brief conversation at the start. Leo Jankowski does at least get a bit of an arc. He starts off incredibly annoying when you speak at Tarsus before the attack. When you meet up with him later, he's working with the Omar to provide a bit of extra protection. He ends up becoming one of them, although not entirely by choice it seems. Overall, Invisible War fails at nearly everything it sets out to do with the main story. There's no clear theme or message. No interesting conversations that make you think about the world we live in today and the one we might inhabit in the future. The plot is much of nothing and doesn't move things forward at all from the last game. In fact, there's a better than average chance it will end exactly the same way the first game ended, depending on your choices, obviously. Characters are either flat or annoying, and the protagonist barely has any personality of note. Gameplay-wise, he's practically a god among men. Personality-wise, he's completely unremarkable. One area in which Invisible War does succeed is with the side content, and if there had been more little stories like the rival coffee shops, the world of Invisible War might not have felt so flat. In each of the major locations you come across Pequod's and Queequeg's coffee shops. Queequeg's is presented as the little guy just trying to get by, with Pequod's a slightly more prestigious establishment. The managers of each store ask you to complete small tasks like sabotaging the other franchise or helping a deal go through. Sometimes you can help both stores, other times they both want you to do the same thing, like advertising at a large concert, and you must choose who to help. Eventually you discover that both coffee companies are owned and controlled by the same corporation. They are encouraged to operate as rivals because it's seen as good for business, however the money all ends up in the same place. It's not dissimilar to how both the WTO and the Order are run by the Illuminati. I thought this was a nice touch and showed some good world building, because in the world of Invisible War there likely wouldn't be room for small or middle sized chains of coffee shops. Anything remotely successful would end up being consumed by a mega corporation. There's also an optional story in another Tarsus school where some children have gone missing. If you investigate you discover that the head teacher is working with the Templar and plans to kill the most promising students to stop the spread of augmented humans. I killed the head teacher and the Templar agents, but you can resolve issues like this by passing the information on to a singer called NG Resonance. NG Resonance is a real person, but she also has holographic dancing projections everywhere, and the WTO use these to gather information. So if you like, you can grasp people up for a small reward. Alex D needs a pilot for all his country hopping, and while he can hire one who will take him directly to the objective each time, he can also rescue a pilot called Ava Johnson who works for free. She drops you off slightly further from the objective, although given how small the levels are this makes no difference. Ava is looking for her passenger, and conveniently she always needs to go to the same place as you do. Unsurprisingly, given that you never see her in person, Ava turns out to be an AI created by Tracer Tong back during the events of the original game, and the passenger she's hunting is JC Denton, which is why you always need to go to the same place. You have to rescue Ava from the WTO before she can fly you anywhere, which is another one of those weird situations where the game doesn't know how to reconcile the fact that you're constantly killing the very people you're supposed to be working with. 
The WTO wants us to fly to Cairo, but they don't let us take Ava as a pilot. So we kill a bunch of WTO agents and free Ava, and the WTO just kind of lets it slide and never mentions it again. Another good example of this is when the Order attacks Tarsus right at the start of the game. The Order is supposedly trying to rescue Alex D, but of course you need enemies to practice on and so they attack you on sight. And this is then later excused by reference to an overzealous captain. Other than some half decent side content, I have struggled to find anything positive to say about Invisible War. Its most remarkable feature is that it's unremarkable, and at best it is a fairly smooth experience that lets you switch off your brain and play as an overpowered superhero for a bit. That is assuming you can get the damn thing working. Invisible War does not play nicely with modern PCs. I don't mean the random bugs like falling through the world or the weird way jumping sometimes propels you way too high or far. I mean the fact that you often can't get past loading screens. When I first booted up Invisible War, I created my character and was raring to go when it just hung on a black screen. This is a common problem and fairly widespread. As is always the case with these things, it won't affect everyone, and the people who aren't affected are typically vocal and annoying about it, but it's clearly a big issue that does affect a lot of players. The problem seems to stem from Invisible War not playing nice with multi-core processors. I downloaded a mod called Invisible Upgrade, which fixes the issue for some people, but not for me. I tried forcing Invisible War to run on a single core via Task Manager, and even downloaded Project Lasso to do the same, but still no luck. I found that killing any processes in the wait chain worked sometimes, but not always, and even if it did work I had to do this on every load screen, and as I mentioned there are a lot of load screens. I had to move over to my Task Manager to clear processes every time I went to a new area. I noticed that after doing this about 10 times the problem stopped for as long as I kept the application open. If I closed it then I had to start closing processes again until the problem fixed itself. And even when things were working smoothly the game would sometimes crash at load screens so I had to quick save a lot. That is way too much hassle for such a bland game. In fact unless you desperately need to play Invisible War, say as part of a series of YouTube videos on the Deus Ex franchise, I recommend you just don't bother. Invisible War's main redeeming quality is that you simply don't need to play it. It's so pointless that even if you are a Deus Ex fan who wants to experience the entire story, you can skip this without worry. There's so little of value here that you can pretend the story of Deus Ex ended with the first game and not really miss out. And that gets to the heart of the issue really. There's no reason to play Invisible War. It doesn't add anything to the Deus Ex story, it doesn't make you think either in terms of the theme and ideas or how you build your character and play the game. If you want to play it as a mindless shooter that's fine, but there are thousands of games that are better as straight shooters. I know I've compared Invisible War to its predecessor a lot. As a follow up to Deus Ex, Invisible War is bad. I don't think there's any good argument to the contrary. However, even if you consider Invisible War on its individual merits, it doesn't excel in any area. It doesn't offer anything to remember it by. At best it's fine because it doesn't push back. Deus Ex could be exhausting, but for me that made it rewarding. Invisible War is short, relaxing and easy. If it had a story or protagonist worth caring about I could at least recommend it for that, but those are missing too. It's just 10 to 12 hours of nothing. Alright that's it from me today, if you enjoyed this video please hit like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I also have a Patreon if you'd like to go the extra mile and support the channel financially. I will of course be covering all the main Deus Ex games, so make sure you're subscribed if you want to hear my opinion on Human Revolution and Mankind Divided. Those videos should both be out by Christmas if all goes to plan. In the meantime I have a video on Dead Space 2 coming up, plus the next part of my series on the history of isometric CRPGs which covers Wasteland 2. Ok until next time, cheers.